Tetralogy of Fallot by Dr. Umjai Mazwi. My name is Umjai Mazwi. I'm a fellow in cardiology and critical care at Children's Hospital Boston, and I'm going to talk to you very briefly about Tetralogy of Fallot. This is not an exhaustive discussion, but rather a chance to give you a brief overview of some of the very important things to understand about Tetralogy of Fallot. Epidemiology. So let's just start out with the, the epidemiology. This is an important form of cardiac cyanosis to understand because it's very common. It's approximately 10% of all congenital heart disease. And then just as important, particularly in the developing world, is that it's the most survivable form of cyanotic heart disease. So as a form of cyanotic heart disease, its prevalence increases with age. Physiology. In understanding how it comes about, there's a single inciting event as the heart develops that explains all four features of Tetralogy of Fallow. And that is anterior malalignment of the conal or infundibular septum. What that creates is the four classic features of tetralogy, specifically aortic override, a large unrestricted ventricular septal defect, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, and then concentric hypertrophy of the right ventricle. The physiology that results from those four features is easy to understand if you grasp one central principle, and that is the VSD is unrestrictive. And what that means is that the pressure in the right ventricle is the same as the pressure in the left ventricle. So from a functional standpoint, both of those ventricles function as a single unit. What that means is that if a red blood cell is in one of those ventricles, the direction that it takes leaving the heart i.e. either going to the lungs or going to the body, is entirely dependent on the resistance to blood flow. Blood will flow in the direction of lowest resistance. If the pulmonary stenosis is severe and it's easier for blood to go to the body than it is to go to the lungs, then that causes cyanosis because that causes a right to left shunt at the VSD. If the pulmonary stenosis is fairly mild and it's easier for the blood to go to the lungs than it is to go to the body, then the VSD is left to right and the patient can be quite pink and overcirculated and develop heart failure. And so Tetralogy of Fallow can exist along a spectrum from patients who are overcirculated and behave like patients with large VSDs to patients that have critical pulmonary stenosis where there's not a large enough opening in the right ventricular outflow tract to allow enough pulmonary blood flow to sustain life. And those are patients that are dependent on a patent ductus arteriosus or a neonatal shunt for survival. Point of clarification. In cases of Tetralogy of Fallot with severe obstruction to the pulmonary outflow tract, it may be necessary to place a shunt in order to provide a direct pulmonary blood flow from the systemic circulation. This may be achieved using methods such as a placement of a synthetic conduit. The location of the surgical shunt placement is often determined at the discretion of the cardiac surgeon, but can involve placement of a shunt between the right ventricle and main pulmonary artery, or between the subclavian artery and the ipsilateral pulmonary artery. It is important to note that specific management of patients with severe pulmonary outflow tract obstruction is beyond the scope of this talk, as it requires complex planning for surgical repair based upon the patient's specific anatomy. There's also an additional element of tetralogy physi physiology that's important to understand, and that is the dynamic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction that can be superimposed upon this baseline physiology that we've just discussed. The dynamic obstruction is when muscle bundles that exist in the right ventricular outflow tract basically more or less go into spasm. That dramatically increases resistance to blood flow going to the lungs, and so blood flow 
preferentially goes to the body, causing a very large right to left shunt at the VSD and making the patient extremely blue because blood can't go out to the lungs and pick up oxygen. These are also known as TET spells or hypocyanotic spells. And I want you to understand this physiology because we will talk a little bit more about this when we talk about how tetralogy is managed. Clinical features. So features that might make you think that a patient that you are seeing with cyanosis, that is cardiac in origin, has tetralogy, are the following. Patients with tetralogy are typically cyanotic and relatively comfortable. The majority of patients with tetralogy are blue and not pink. Uh, there are chest x-ray features that suggest tetralogy. That is a boot-shaped heart with the apex lifted off the diaphragm. And the exam features, although helpful, are not specific. Tetralogy can sometimes be associated with a tapping apex as a result of the hypertrophic right ventricle. And there is a systolic murmur that you can hear in tetralogy that is the murmur of pulmonary stenosis. It's not a murmur associated with the VSD because there's no restriction to blood flow across the ventricular septum. Being a pulmonary stenosis murmur, it's a murmur that's heard loudest in the pulmonic area and it radiates superiorly and to the back. One of the interesting features of tetralogy is because the VSD is unrestrictive, when patients have more severe pulmonary stenosis, quite often the murmur actually gets quieter. And that's because blood can go across the VSD and out to the body rather than passing through the area of obstruction. So the loudness of the murmur does not predict in tetralogy the degree of pulmonary stenosis. Diagnosis. Let's talk a little bit about how you would diagnose tetralogy if you thought that a patient that you were seeing had this diagnosis. The diagnosis is confirmed by echocardiography. So you'd have clinical features that suggested the diagnosis and you'd perform an echo to confirm that diagnosis. In addition to confirming the four features of tetralogy um, uh, that we've run through and trying to understand how those four features explain the physiology that you're seeing. There's one additional very important feature of tetralogy to talk about in the diagnosis, and that is an understanding of the coronary anatomy. The anatomy of the coronary arteries in tetralogy can vary in ways that affect your ability to perform a surgical repair. Uh, classically, for instance, if the left anterior descending coronary artery comes from the right coronary artery, or if the left anterior descending artery is supplied by both the right and the left coronary systems, there are coronary branches that cross areas of the infundibulum or right ventricular outflow tract that complicate the process of repair because they can be injured in the process of repair. Management. The management of tetralogy is variable and is dependent upon the degree of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Milder degrees of tetralogy, which are far more common, present in the newborn period with cyanosis and the murmur that we discussed, as well as the chest x-ray findings that we've already talked about. Milder degrees of tetralogy can be associated with heart failure due to pulmonary overcirculation and behave much more like patients with just a very large VSD. Those patients are typically monitored for the first year of life um, and are typically repaired at some point within that first year. Uh, worldwide, the timing of repair varies because the phenotype varies as well, but uh, typically sometime between three and six months of age, the defect is repaired to limit the exposure of the patient to the effects of chronic cyanosis. One indication to repair patients much earlier than this is TET spells. A patient who's having a TET or a hypocyanotic spell uh, does need to have a repair. That is an absolute indication to take that patient for either a repair or a shunt. If that degree is severe, 
it can be called critical. Critical pulmonary stenosis is a ductal dependent lesion and those patients require prostaglandins until they can have a more definitive intervention like a repair or a shunt. One of the interesting things about tetralogy physiology is because the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction is fixed, patients that start out with milder degrees of obstruction will tend to develop more and more severe obstruction as they get bigger because as the rest of the heart grows, that portion of the heart does not. So whatever the cyanosis is when the patient is first born will typically be progressive unless there is an intervention. Hypercyanotic TET spells. Finally, I want to talk about TET spells or hypercyanotic spells because these are true medical emergencies. We discussed the physiology as being a dynamic obstruction to right ventricular outflow creating effectively critical pulmonary stenosis causing a very large right to left shunt at the VSD and severe cyanosis. The management for hypocyanotic spells involves placing the patient in a knee chest position, so folding the knees up against the chest because that increases systemic vascular resistance and makes that red blood cell sitting in the ventricle more likely to try to go through the lungs than to go to the body. With that measure, some of these spells can be terminated, but assuming that the spell is progressive, other options are morphine. The exact mechanism by which morphine works is not fully understood, but a dose of morphine, a bolus of fluid, a bolus of fluid increases intracardiac mixing uh, and can improve saturations. Beta blockers. Beta blockers are thought to decrease the dynamic obstruction to right ventricular outflow uh, by causing muscle relaxation. And that can improve saturations by decreasing the magnitude of the right to left shunt. And then finally, if you really, really are stuck, phenylephrine or norepinephrine or epinephrine, an agent that suddenly increases systemic vascular resistance in a way that makes it easier for that red cell to go to the lungs and improve saturations than to go to the body. Summary. Tetralogy of Fallot is a congenital cardiac defect consisting of Fallot's four components, a ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, overriding aorta, and right ventricular hypertrophy. Patient presentation can vary depending upon unique anatomy and the degree of obstruction to the right ventricular outflow tract. While patients with Tetralogy of Fallot may appear cyanotic, present with certain characteristic features on chest x-ray, such as a boot-shaped heart, or have an audible systolic murmur upon auscultation. A diagnosis of Tetralogy of Fallot should be confirmed by an echocardiogram. Patient-specific factors including, but not limited to, anomalous coronary artery anatomy, and degree of pulmonary stenosis can complicate management of patients with tetralogy of Fallot. Therefore, more complex planning that accounts for the patient's individual anatomy is required prior to surgical repair. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.